Hello. Hello. What is B for Artist? Well, today's your special lucky day because I will be explaining it uh, in detail about what it is, why it is, who does it, and how do we do it, in case you want to do your own fork. Uh, so let's begin. B for Artist is an open source fork of Blender focused on a set of interface guidelines distributed and documented freely by volunteers. 100% free. You can find the code on GitHub. You can uh, download it, use it, compile it, work with it, take any commit, use it. Free. Just like Blender. Unlike Blender, though, we have some changes. So, to make things a little bit clear and easy to digest to understand what this is, uh, B for Artists basically on a technical level is over 3,000 commits and changes to vanilla Blender. A lot. Just to keep in mind right now, Blender is about 5,500 open commits with another 3,000 from B for Artists. It's a lot of just little details and things that have changed. So we need some metaphors. Who here likes to cook? Yeah, all right. Blender, just like the blender from the kitchen, is like the kitchen. It's got everything. We've got a stove, we've got a fridge, we've got a spoon, a cup, a knife, a cutting board, and especially we've got a fork. <laughs> all right, so B for Artist takes the idea of the kitchen, and every one of us has a different taste of cooking. Some people like to keep the cups in the cupboard. Some people like to keep the knives in the drawer. Some people like to keep things hidden away, clean, and the bench clean. Other people, they like to have no doors on their cupboards. They like to have the knife at an easy reach. They like to have the fridge to the left, the stove to the right, the sink to the front. Beef Riders is a bit like that. It's like a different person's kitchen. You walk in, you can see where everything is, you grab the spices, you start cooking. It's just a preference. Other people like it clean and minimal, super cool, great. That's another kitchen. It's just another way of cooking. And another metaphor to keep it in mind as well, like when it comes to community and development and other ideas, is we have a surgeon fish. A surgeon fish is a, a small fish that loves to clean the big fish. So Blender's the big fish with uh, sometimes it's pretty busy just swimming around the sea, but maybe it might get some sand stuck in the gills behind its head. They have no arms, it can't scratch it. So the surgeon fish, because it's very particular and has its own personality and also taste, it likes to eat the algae from underneath the gills behind where the big fish can't scratch. So beef riders and the developers there and the people who use it are the ones that are like very particular and just want a different way of doing things. So let's take a look. So what do I do with this particular project? Well, I work with development. I, I work with Rainer, who founded the project eight years ago. I work with Iyad Ahmed, who is a legend, a hero, a close friend, and I really care about him a lot. Uh, this project couldn't have been without those two. I came in maybe six years ago, and I also work with Juso, with Sean, and we do development together. It's a team effort and it's volunteer work in our free time. I do DevOps, I help with the release, which means I go back to Colombia, and as soon as I get off the plane, I'm on the computer working on the next release because we try to stay up to date with Blender. After that, I also do sponsorship. I receive some sponsorship from some benefactors, well, not really benefactors, family, and I sometimes redistribute the sponsorship in a way of uh, bounties and things like that when I can. It's not a lot. So, what is the target market? As we mentioned, the surgeon fish, the target market is about artists. It's about the individual. It's about the cook, the person in the kitchen who wants to eat. The artist wants to make a cake. The artist wants to make a, a big, nice slab of steak. Maybe wants to make some muffins or, or a nice stir fry. Each artist wants to express themselves and tell a story the individual artist, the indie artist, the solo artist, the hobbyist, uh, the artist in the studio. It's more about 
the particular artist, and that's why we try to focus on that particular market. Slightly more laser focused than the general market of Blender. So, what do we do with Blender? How do we complement? What is the symbiosis? Just like the surgeon fish, the big fish benefits from somebody cleaning up the, the gills, but also Blender has 100% of the open source 3D community. We have about 12,000 average downloads per month, which adds 1%. So Beef Riders targets a market that may not be happy or who like Blender, but they want come from another angle. So a little bit about me. I used True Space when I was a kid. I learned it, it was my first love. I loved it so much, full of icons. The whole interface is icons. Then I use Soft Image. The user experience is very nice, super streamlined, very efficient, very non-destructive as well. Loved it so much. And then I got to Blender in 2.74, and uh, I needed something that wouldn't die <laughs> because True Space and Soft Image just, just didn't work. So I found this particular project which um, added a little bit of a, a personal taste of iconography that I really liked. And that's why we continue developing this even today. So we add to the Blender community with an extra 1% of users that potentially may have never or won't want to use Blender. So now we're 101% of using Blender features. And I think that's beautiful, to be honest. So after that, why do we be for artists? So. Be, to be is like, that's, that's the reason why we're here. We're about the story, we're about the cook. We do the code, we do the documentation, and we do the work for the artist. That's the origin of the name, that's why we do it, to keep it in our mind always. So, to do that, we have to focus on the seven pillars of our vision and philosophy, on the, the user interface guidelines. So the first, we're gonna go through each seven of them, and then I'm gonna have a little bit of a tour because lo and behold, whoops, I'm doing this in another software. So the first pillar that we have here is number one. Hey, why is it doing that? Top level access. So top level access is our first pillar, which is a big one, mainly because we prioritize point and clicking. We like to use a mouse, we like to point on it, and we want to work with it. We try to expose hidden floating menus. So Blender has pie menus, for example. But if you ask somebody, where do you find a pie menu in the interface? You can't. It's not exposed in the interface. There is no guided user experience to show you how to use a Pi menu unless you memorize or find out what that hotkey is. So we expose those hidden operators and we show that Pi menus exist inside the interface. You can see that it has a hotkey assigned to it and you can discover it. We also try to keep things uh, kind of in a surface level. So imagine you want to get the pressure cooker. The pressure cooker is in the back of, back of the cupboard. So you've got to move the pots and the fry pans and the wok and you move it out of the way to get to the pressure cooker. And then you can start using it. So in this case, we try to have a philosophy where anything that's beyond three levels deep or two levels deep, bring it up to the surface. If it's common use, bring it up to the surface. If it's too deep, bring it up one. We try to keep things not so deep so you don't have to zigzag so hard. Top level access is really important to us, especially when it comes to pointing and clicking in the interface to discover everything. The next thing that we have is iconography. When you first open Beef Riders, you see a huge Christmas light show of icons, mainly because I don't like reading. <laughs> we are, we are working, we're a different type of cook where we're not looking at the labels, we're not looking at the, the name of the pot, we just want to see something, grab it, and use it. So when it comes to neuroscience and a, a concept of art and, contra and, and developing something that can read, you always start with silhouette and contrast. And from there, you use color. So 
we're hunters, we're out there in the wild, and you can see something kind of crazy and interesting, and you see something move around to the side, you see like a shape. That shape is what you first see. It's the first thing you process. And then you're like, oh, was that shape a dangerous red color? Was it a dangerous animal? Was it bright orange? Was it a tiger? You see the color. Then from there, you start looking at the details after you've captured what that object and shape is. And then from there, you add the, we look at the details. Was that berry, the thing that we saw in the bush or something just briefly? Does it have good skin? Is it fresh and ripe or is it rotting? You look at the details and the form. So we use that philosophy with the iconography. Blender currently has maybe 800 icons or so. Right now, we're running at 2,500. So how do you differentiate 2,500 icons with just lines and one or two colors? So we've redesigned the whole entire interface, and we made everything iconized, every operator, every prop inside of our panels and things that we need. Everything has an icon so that Anybody, regardless of the language, can see what it does, can relate it with the colors, and move on. And it just point and click and target it. Differentiate something out of 2,500 different icons. So that's a, a key aspect. It's not for everybody. Sometimes it's a bit of an overload stimuli, but it does help when it comes to general use for some people. Our third pillar, as you can see, Oh, just to expand on that, we see what an operator does before reading. With a direct visual cue versus zigzag movement, we have visual targets to mouse over to, and this saves a slight pause of moving our eyesight to read something. To expand on the neuroscience behind that, a baby is born with not very clear eyesight, but they can see silhouette. They can see color. They see all the bright colors, and they, they even see and hear, hear the colors. And they see the silhouette, and they know what to do with that silhouette to feed themselves. And from there, later on in life, we learn to read. So reading is a second nature kind of ability that we learn that requires more cognitive power to use. So for the efficiency of pointing and hitting and targeting things, we use the iconography to target that primitive state of the brain. So from there, user customizability. When it comes to Blender, Blender being open source and being really nice and cool and flexible, we can also use toggable toolbars, toggable customizable tab tool shelf, customizable top level overlays for toggles to make life easier. As you know, we're all cooks, we're all artists. We maybe have a particular way of using our spices, a particular way of frying something. Maybe we use a wok to cook meat. I don't know why. Well, well we do. Some people do, some people don't. And we mix and match different things, so we try to give a personalized experience with everything. So most of the things that we've developed for Blender are either opt-out or optional, which means you can customize your user interface for the workflow that you need. A typical example is I will show you in a moment. The fourth pillar is discoverability. We often show hidden operators that are often hockey only, we show tooltips everywhere, even on enums, which means it's the type of code that is like a, usually has the same tooltip for different operation types or props within the operator. And we expose hockey exclusives of entries to the GUI, for example, the Pi menus I mentioned earlier. So when we show these things out, it, uh, and adding tooltips, adding a bit of a description, expanding tooltips, adding uh, operators that once were hidden inside of a hockey only operator, which there are quite a few inside Blender, uh, pff, more than a few dozen. It makes things a little bit discoverable inside the interface so that any cook can come into the kitchen and see it and use it. The other thing that we try to focus on is consistency, which is, for example, a repeat, hopper, uh, repeat hotkey or repeat operator. We try to keep one path to it unless the Unless you choose to go to the operator through another way with an opt-in option, we try to make it clear and minimized. We also focus on operator names and menu order. So for example, there's a view menu in all of the editors. The view menu has some operators in a certain way. We make sure that all of the view menus has the same order. If you try to do this in Blender, they're all mixed up and changed a little bit. So we want kind of a muscle memory inside the menu orders in general, where it's relevant, wherever possible. Lots of tiny little adjustments. 
And from there, we also try to focus on user experience when it comes to different operators and modes and objects by fine-tuning some small things here and there, like brushes, uh, the way you manage your swap colors, the props that are exposed in the different types of ways, just the little details here and there to make sure that it's slightly polished. And then from there, we focus on reference documentation. The reference documentation, we don't know how many people read it because it is <laughs> it's nearly 3,000 pages large and it's a PDF or multiple chapters, but we do this more for the developer side, uh, mainly because we document the interface piece by piece by piece, panel by panel by panel, operator by operator by property by last panel. Everything is documented with a reference, meaning that when we do a task, we document it. We do another task, we document it. We make sure this documentation is up to date to make sure that things are working in a consistent way, in a logical order, and that everything is clear and consistent. It's downloadable offline as well, so you could use it in like a, a low internet resource area, and it's also done in an open source way with LibreOffice without using code. There's no markup, there's no compiling, and then we just share it on the internet with GitHub and GitFlow. And the last but most interesting part that we're still working on, it's been a, an ongoing process because this is a love child, it's a volunteer project, there's not a lot of time goes into it, is we always try to focus on less hits are the best hits, which means we need thoughtful defaults. The less, uh, well, how, what do we consider a hit in the interface? You know, a hit is, uh, I guess what you could say is, when you move the mouse up to open a menu, that's a hit. You move the mouse back down, and you click on it, that's a hit. You press one hotkey, then the other hotkey, and then you move the mouse and it goes to somewhere else, that's, that's three or four hits. So if we have less hits to use Blender, it makes it slightly easier to use. Maybe you save 20%, maybe you save 30%, maybe you save half of the clicks to get the same job done, less bureaucracy, more efficient and happy use. So with that, I want to show and not tell. So in the interface, for example, in the side panel here, when we're animating inside a blender and you have a selection of bones and a selection of objects and I want to keyframe just one of these, I can right click on it and I insert a single keyframe, but it would only work on the active object. Then from there, I'll have to click on it again and copy the keyframe to the others. So in this case, or use a keying set. Or I could just hold down Alt and record. And that will record a keyframe on everything that is selected, bones or objects. This is something Blender cannot do. That's a user interface thing. Or if I want to, say, export Alembics often, I can take a look at one of these menus and I can choose which one I want, and now I can do that. Or I just want to like click the recovery button, and it'll reload the scene, and everything should be fine. Or I can save as or open a new file directly from here. So alternatively, in Blender, I'll be using a hotkey, opening up the menu, moving the mouse down, selecting. Or hotkey, open up the quick menu. I marked it before. Scroll down and find it, read it. There's no icon in the menu, unfortunately. And then click it. Or click on File, scroll down, and then click on Open. So all of them have an extra movement or other on top of just open. Other things we have, for example, I change the wireframe often, but I have a very crowded quick menu. So I can expose the wireframe toggle to the header, and when I need it, I just click on it and can show the wireframe on or off, lock the view, show the camera, lock the camera, etc. when I need it, so that I can uh, move the camera and stay in it when it's locked or when I want to move out of the camera and keep the camera where it was as the blend default without needing to go to the view panel, view panel here again, then lock camera to view. One, two, three, four steps versus one. The other thing as well here is in the side panel with all of these uh, options, if I use the mirror operators often over and over and over and over again, I could add it to the quick menu, I could use a hotkey, press M, then press another hotkey to get the axis, one, two, three actions, or I can just mouse over and click. And if I want to, I can pin the panel and move it up to the top or to the bottom 
and use it whenever I want, and I also have three columns when I need it. Same with the menus. If I'm in, for example, I'm using the sculpt mode. Uh, let's see if this goes into, no, it wouldn't go into sculpt mode, here we go. So if I'm in the sculpt mode and I'm using face sets, and I want to initialize a face set by a certain way, unless I've already remarked it earlier, at least I can see the material icon and understand that it is a material. And if I want to, I can even store my brushes inside the add-ons that we have so that I can have multiple clay brushes exposed to the top level. So that I could have a lot of way, like the Zeta brush type of workflow where I have 10 different brushes for the, for the clay sculpting. I can store it inside my libraries with my own custom icons. Everything should be fine and ready to go. Or if I'm in animation, there's a lot of things that I can work with. So let's, um, let's go deeper or just in fine detail. The iconography, also with panels, if we take a look at the panels here, if I look down at this drop down and show the overlays, I'm not showing the grid at the moment. When you show the grid, you have all these operators up here, X, Y, Z, I don't know why the X is not showing, it's probably my laptop. And from there, I can hide it and indicate that there is hidden content to keep things minimal and organized. More often than not, most artists will not be using motion tracking so I can hide all of those properties and indicate that it is hidden. This is something that we try to do also with organization of props and panels. We always have a label, we always have an indent, we do this consistently, absolutely everywhere so that we can group our ideas in a similar way. There was a very good talk about add-on UX here just uh, yesterday about that. So we try to implement that directly inside of Blender. And just a, just a side note, this is Blender. We try to keep up to date with this, and it is practically Blender. This just has a different interface, or a, a polished interface. So what else do we have? What else do we have? Let's take a closer look. All right, full screen. Next slide. The customizable toolbar, which I really love, thanks to Rainer. The 3D view tab shelf, thanks to Iyad Ahmed. He's such a legend for doing this. I love this tool shelf a lot. Saves me so much brain power, a little bit. Another thing is uh, 3D view overlays, the ones that I showed earlier. And from there, the options, panels, and indents. And we also have the 3D view sidebar with the animation. And we also have the properties editor. For example, down here in the bottom left, we have the transparent toggle because it is relevant to the alpha channel of a file. So we made it grouped in the same area so that if an artist comes from another software or they're saving something in Photoshop, they know that inside of the file dialog, you store alpha inside the file export dialog. This is the file export dialog. There's the transparency toggle. Just familiarity with some other standards. And from there, we also have other changes, for example, in the node editor. So if I go into my node editor and take a closer look and I make like a geometry nodes, I have this uh, panel here. Typically, I would shift A, whoops, or add in uh, the node shelf. Maybe I'll start typing to search, or I use the search op operator in here, and I find the node if I know the name. Maybe I'm using a different language and it has a different name. So in this case, we try to keep things also exposed alternatively to the side shelf. If you memorize an icon, you can. And for example, if I'm using a, a color node, like this, and I, collect, and I have it like this, and I change the name. So for example, this is going to be my main color. The icon on the header still remains the same so that I know what is the node, even if I've changed the names and organized my trees. And I can just, if I'm going to like quickly create, for example, uh, lots of join node geometries, I can like just quickly mouse over and click multiple times to add these nodes. So to add four join geometry nodes, I'm either create one, select, duplicate, four times, shift D, shift D, shift D, instead I just mouse over and click. Other things as well that we have in mind from the node editors is we have, whoa, where'd my camera go? There we go. The animation user, user experience. So for example, when it comes to animation layers, Blender does have that. 
Uh, typically, the default in Blender when you create an animation clip is that it is replacing the animation below it. So when you're layering your animations, these animation clips override the other as if it was isolated. When it comes to like thinking about the defaults, we created it so that when an animator creates a new animation layer, it uses the combine default so that we have animation layers built in directly when you create a new clip on top of the other as a default. Previously, you'd have to create a clip, create a track, change the clip, change the track, create another track, create another clip, change the clip property, and then you have layers. So with these types of concepts, we try to make it simple and easy so that animation layers is something, uh, a default functioning. If I want to isolate the, car, the track, I just press the star button, and that's isolated. Or I tab into it in the isolate mode instead of the combined mode. That functionality of having it replacing the track below being isolated is already part of it. So that's what we try to work on. There are a lot of things, lots of little details. So after that, it's a lot of work. We've also done some things into the outliner, like quickly changing over the, the, the files and also like checking out the different slides, currently on scene 29. In this particular case, to manage scenes, you would have to use this drop down up here. And so now you can use right here, if I'm working with hundreds of shots or dozens of shots, I'm using an outliner on a different monitor. What do I do? Well, I can easily just find that scene and I can copy it with a right click. Inside of Blender, the only thing that I can do is delete. But if I'm managing scenes, if I'm using my shots and I'm doing these scenes to work on different things, we try to think of exposing operators that you would typically use in the editor that is in the API, but is not discoverable. So we try to make it a bit E, uh, manageable to work these different things. Same with uh, these drop downs, for example. If I hide the objects, I don't need to see them all until I activate it again. And a number of other things like iconography and others. So there's a lot going on. So with the add ons, we also added functionality with resetting the view. A smart delete, so that when I select a face, press delete, it's gone, just like it would in most other software. I select a vertice, press delete, it's gone. Uh, you also have a brush panels add-on, which I just showed a case earlier with the brushes and things like that, so that we can have multiple brushes in the same brush settings. I'm happy that Blender's working on this soon. I hope it comes out soon, so that it's redundant. So now we get to the big question. This is a lot of work. 3,000 base changes to the Blender core. It's been alive for eight years. How do you maintain a fork? This is why we're here. So a fork is basically an independent distribution or an independent kind of bridge from the side of Blender. So if you think of this orange line up here, this is the Blender main branch. And this blue line is the B4 Artist master or main branch. So we have a separate trunk which we can distribute freely to other people. In this case, our users for free. If you're working in a studio, or if you're working in a, with your own pipeline, this is where you'd have your own version, kind of like an add-on main, and this is where you would work. So we need to commit to branches and master to do our development, but in this particular case, we always work with a side branch when we do our merges. When it comes to the code, we uh, stick to about 20% of the code is Python for the interface, but there are some things that we need to change in C. We need to like, uh, there's a lot of things we need to do. And with that, we have things very heavily commented inside of the code, heavily commented. Almost every line other than icons or tooltips is commented. Why? So that we know when something is gonna break. This process is a weekly process. We have to do it by week because if we don't do it by week, the development from Blender is too fast and then it becomes too big to manage. So this is a constant job, part-time or full-time. So when we merge the Blender main into our synchronization branch, after we merged our master into the synchronization branch, we start to see a lot of errors, a lot of problems. Everything's broken. Some of the documents butt heads. And because that happens, we have to go through the commit logs, find out what changed, task by task by task, which could be hundreds of commits from Blender every week, 
and then make sure that everything that's relevant to what we're doing is up to date, working, and clear. That it follows the paradigm. Does it have the iconography? Does it have the tooltips? Does it have the documentation? Is it in the correct place? Is the property in an op is the option instead of a header menu? Is it the option in an option panel? Is uh, is the, the yeah a lot of little details. Then we update our tracker in a granular way, and then we pull the sync once it's compiling and ready to go. Once it's perfectly squeaky clean, then we merge it to main and we continue doing work. Sometimes this work takes all week. Sometimes it just takes four hours. Depends on how fast Blender is working. And it's tricky, but it is very important. Why do we have to do this weekly maintenance before we do development? Because we need to future proof the project. We need to make sure that it is alive, living and well for the long term future. We've got to resolve the conflicts, go through the commit logs, sync all the add-ons, make sure that they merge together. Sometimes we modify the add-ons to have the same philosophy as everything else. For example, the node wrangler or the, uh, the import-export add-ons. And the biggest, most difficult document to maintain in the fork is the space 3dview.py. Because this is a massive editor. It's, it's, it's the biggest editor of the whole Blender document uh, area. So we can't merge this document. This has to be spliced in manually. So our workflow in that particular case is we compare Blender from one week ago with this particular document with Blender this week. We see what changed. Oh, that changed. Why? From this commit. Oh, OK. Let's grab it, manually put it in, make a task, update it, and carry on. Because if we do an automatic merge, we either squash our own issues or our own uh, updates, or we've destroyed everything and it just stops working. We also update the default theme, which requires recompiling it. New icons requires recompiling. The documentation to keep things sharp. And from there, when we're ready, after the maintenance, after, we can start focusing on feature updates. Because we don't want a version of BFI that's distributed to the people that we use suddenly stop working because we weren't staying up to date with Blender. We have to stay at the same speed. So this is the importance of granularity. Hey, why did it go, why did it do that? There you go, so here's the tracker. So when it comes to the tracker, we have a, um, the tracker is very important. We chose to use GitHub because it has discussions and we have the ability for feature requests. Uh, we try to listen to the artists, we being for them, so we need them to talk and we need to have a way to track what somebody's asking for. So when we have a discussion, we can convert a discussion into a task, then we can create a branch from the task and work to it. Or we can have a discussion about it and say, nah, that doesn't fit the seven pillars that we have. Uh, good, good, good suggestion, but uh, uh, sorry, we can't develop it. We tracked it, it's closed, it's now done. Another thing that we try to do is keep it like a very clear that it is, everything needs to be tracked. And that's why we need to focus on the importance of granularity. So how do we troubleshoot? The more granular we are, the better. So now we need to focus on troubleshooting. We try not to touch the core features of Blender. We try to keep feature parity with Blender, make sure that all the features are working side by side. But sometimes we find a bug. When we do find a bug, after we've got a working compile, after everything's working okay, we ask ourselves, does this work in the source? Does this work in Blender or am I having difficulties? Is it with me or is it with them? <laughs> well, no, that's, that's not the case. If it's not a bug in Blender, then it is definitely the fork's problem. So we gotta make sure that we compare the code, make sure that we rebase, go through everything that we've done in the weekly maintenance, and then try again. So, it's, it's, it's a logical process. And then from there, like I mentioned earlier, we link every task to documentation, and this keeps things very sharp, keeping documentation updated and organized, and to make sure everything's okay. And then when you maintain a fork, not only are you just doing the work of maintenance, doing the new features, keeping things going, keeping your job going, keeping the work going for your studio or for whatever way, you have to also think of staying up to date with the Blender release cycle, with the weekly builds, 
and official releases. We don't do daily builds, though GitHub does do it sometimes. The reason being is that we try to merge once a week, once a week because it is a lot of work to do it every day. We try to do it in a weekend because it's very quiet in the Blender Foundation. That means there's no new code happening. So the weekend, let's do the merge while they're, all, while they're sleeping. And then from there, we have a weekly release that we um, leave for free for everybody to download from the website and to test out. So that's something you ought to keep in mind. It's like, okay, so how often are you deploying? How often are you going to do the merge? How often are you going to work with that? So let's talk about the juicy, interesting part. The symbiosis with Blender. What is the history of B for Artists? And how did it influence Blender? Or how has it been maybe influencing Blender? How do we share code or different ideas or user interface things? I guess we can take a closer look. So ever since b 4 Artists came into being from version one, which is a before uh, Blender 2.79 era, we had workspace tabs, we had an iconized buttons in a tool shelf, and we had a left click select default. These ideas, I think, were common knowledge that everybody liked. And when 2.8 came out, we celebrated. We were, we were having a good time because we had workspace tabs with the addition that we could create custom workspaces. We had an iconized shelf with modal operators now, which means, oh, there, our brains just lit up. Oh, this, this means so much more, bigger buttons, great. And they gave the option of a left click solo, uh, select. And on top of that, throughout the years, sometimes we have new things. So when do we commit upstream? Our focus with B4Itis is usually the interface, the user experience, and having a good time. But when do we decide to say, hey, this is probably better in Blender. Let's uh, try to commit to Blender and hope it works. Uh, in this particular case, feature updates, user uh, operators, operators and things that I need to work inside of Blender before I think about it in the interface. If it's not in the interface in the way somebody handles something, but we need a new way of handling something, we commit it upstream. So in this case, for example, Iyad has done some work with uh, making sure that you can batch rename scenes or batch rename textures. Uh, no, sorry, brushes. This is a work request that we needed for some certain things. So we committed this code to Blender directly and it got in and we can all enjoy it now. So I highly recommend when you're working with a fork and you're doing it on your own, draw a line. When, do, when should you commit to upstream so that it bleeds back down and you don't need to think about it so much? And then focus on what you need to do. So what is the legacy? The legacy of b for artist is the following. We want to walk the talk. Uh, the history has been really good when it, when it comes to the development because we've developed these ideas with a working board, with a fan base that likes to use it, and with ideas of how to use Blender in a, in a friendly way or a faster way or a different way or a more visual way. It doesn't really matter. It depends on the cook or the artist. We want to show the prototype, show the example, give it out there for free, document everything that we do in a very granular way. Every commit, even a single tooltip or a single icon has a task that you can track or find and use. And we show that example with something that works. We walk the talk and that is our legacy. And from there, we just want to cook art, pretty much. And that's why we do this particular software. I'm currently working on a painterly music video project within p 4 Artist, and I do all my client work in here. I guess I'm a big beta tester, I suppose. And with that, we try to grow the community, try to grow, uh, help other artists, work more on customer support, try to get ideas, try to implement things, uh, even get discussions going. And just uh, if something is not done within Blender, we can fast track an idea and get it going before Blender can. So we offer 
an open source alternative for potential Blender users who may come from other software, for example, Max or Maya, or old software like Softimage or, or TrueSpace, who are not too keen to use vanilla Blender, or they tried and they didn't kind of feel at home, or maybe they, they don't want to use the defaults. And we want to do this while providing a working vision of a GUI paradigm, an alternative, based on the source, not a com competition, but based on the base for the community. So what's in the future? The test project, the Pentily web series, has a number of episodes more to do, and we want to continue developing the community and grow. We also want to get some good presets for artists. Secret is out. We might get some node groups for shaders. Um, shipped as a default. And also, we want to develop a better knowledge base so that it's a bit easier to pick up. Technically, when you use Beef Riders, all Blender material, add-ons, most add-ons, if it's compatible with the latest from Blender, uh, the, in other words, we're already running on the 4.1 base, um, which means if an add-on is broken in 4.0 or 4.1, you may find difficulty in the next release. But we don't have much of a choice here, so we have to make sure that we're always branching and always forking from the Blender main to future-proof it, or else the branches of an official release usually stray too far away. So when you're doing a fork, I also do recommend this as well. When you're building your fork, try to stick close to the main and do not fork from an official release because over a few weeks, over a few months, over the whole the, the release cycle, it will become almost impossible to maintain your code in a sustainable way. So, fork from the main. And with that, this comes to the end of this talk. So I want to say thank you. And I hope you liked it. <laughs>